nigga, I wanna know if you ready to do this shit. Yeah, Menace came about because we were frustrated and tired of white people saying they deserve what they get. They're just little gang bangers and they deserve to be treated the way they're treated. We thought that the news media was not explaining the inner city that well. They had not done any real in-depth journalism on why these kids are this way. So that motivated us telling the story. Ain't nothing gonna change in Atlanta. I mean, I'm still gonna be black. The Hughes brothers and the writer, Tiger Williams, wanted to document what life was like there for a lot of people. Nigga, hurry the fuck up! Nigga, I know what the fuck I'm doing, you just watch out. What we were trying to do was take a slice of reality and put it on film. Down with a 187. Let's do this. And we want it to be real. Turn that motherfucking shit down. The reaction was what we wanted to be. We had more white people walk up to us genuinely when I never understood why those kids did what they did until I saw this movie. We grew up in Detroit, Michigan, uh, all the way up to nine. 1980, came to a place called Pomona, California, a little city about 35, 40 miles outside of downtown Los Angeles here. Yeah. Our interest in movies first came from things like uh, Superman and Indiana Jones, the popcorn movies. And we were fascinated with the making of movies. The one that really changed it for us is what changed it for a lot of people, which was Scarface. And that was the first time where cinema met pop culture at the same time. And it was kind of like a movie and a film. But I think our love for film came through something pretty obvious and overstated now, Scorsese. Goodfellas is what really got us uh, into the gangster movies. We used that movie as an example of how to do something right in 91 when we were 19. We did a lot of hip-hop music videos. Uh, we did hip-hop videos for, uh, for Tupac, Too Short. We did like 29, 30 videos, I think. We did that for one year. And we got lucky we're developing Menace during that time. Old Dog was the craziest nigga alive. America's nightmare. At the time, Los Angeles was a hotbed for gang activity, drugs, and police brutality. It just wasn't a good environment to be a black male anywhere. You ain't got to be creeping. I don't know why you trying to act like you cleaning up. There was a big racial tension going on down there between the Koreans and the blacks. Anytime you walked into one of their stores, they'd follow you around. Man, I always think we're going to steal something. And the black community had felt that for so long that when the riots did go down, they took it out on those businesses, or they took it out on the closest thing that they can see to the establishment. Boom! Things have been bursting at the seams already with the police and um, the minorities, if you will. You know, not just blacks, Latinos, everybody. And everyone's frustrations just boiled over and it became anarchy, just like the watch riots. The watch riots demolished that area and all the business left. And I think the same thing could be said of the 92 riots. These kids that are coming up nowadays are affected by that. That city was just completely decimated, you know, and nothing came back, you know. If they barely had anything before, then there was nothing after. We framed it in that context just to show that if our people expect to have nothing down there, then expect to get a gun in your face at some point because you've just bred the criminal, you know? We enlisted a writer by the name of Tiger Williams, who happened to be the brother of our best friend in high school, Ryan Williams, who was in the, in the film, played Stacy. Nigga, hell yeah, that's that nigga, man, trying to be me and shit. They needed someone to write some gangster for him, you know, and I told him my brother's a writer, you know, you know, I could hook y'all up, you know. And sure enough, I hooked him up. Sat down, got together, and then we would hang out a lot. You know, during the whole, we'd just sit around, hang out, and talk about story. First I get shot, then you gonna drive me home? Somebody must want me to die. <laughs> we just researched and went out to Jordan Downs, watched South Central. Something few people know is we based this loosely after a character me and Tiger interviewed. So we just got the screenplay flushed out in like a month or two and started getting this shopped around. I had a project with New Line that fell apart in the late stages. And so I got a job producing a music video. And that's where I met the Hughes brothers who were directing it. It was the music video to Brenda's Got a Baby. I'm pregnant. What? And as we went along on the project, I would talk to them and I said, well, what's your ambition? What do you want to do? Yeah, you guys want to do commercials, music videos, is that, that's it? And they're like, no, no, we want to be filmmakers. We want to make movies. And they said, well, we're developing a script with a friend of ours now. 
and it was Menace to Society. And they started telling me about it, and it sounded really intriguing. And I read it, and uh, it shocked me. Darren Scott had given it to New Line, so Bob Shea had put the script on Weekend Read, which meant we would probably get a, an answer on Monday on whether or not they're going to do the movie. And after he read it, I called, and you know, and I, I didn't know what's what was, what's his reaction, you know. And so I asked, and they said Bob cried, and I was like, oh, well, I guess we got a movie then. Y'all niggas hurry up. Go in there, book them niggas, and get the fuck out. Don't be playing. I think, honestly, the reason why Bob Shane Newline decided to give this movie a chance, especially with two 20-year-olds like, that hadn't done anything before, was, and I, I wouldn't have said this in the past, but I think Boys in Hood had a lot to do with it. Boys was a story about one kid who makes it out. And we wanted Ministry Society to be the antithesis. And we wanted to examine, really, why so many kids don't make it out, and what are the reasons why they don't make it out. <laughs> The through line and, and the casting of Menace was like, who's real? Who feels real? Who looks real? So casting Kane was like a no-brainer for us. Nigga, I know you ain't dumb enough to be showing niggas the robbery tape, man. What's up with that? We had seen an episode of American Most Wanted, and there was this young kid in there playing a gangster. And the way he was talking and his mannerisms were like, he gets it, you know? Tyron Turner wasn't even a professional actor, but he had this look that I think everybody could kind of vicariously live through. We got a lot of resistance from New Line because he was a raw talent at the time. The first rehearsal was kind of a disaster. He wasn't ready, and everybody wondered, oh, well, wow, is this guy going to be able to do the part? You know, he has the look, but pretty much nothing else. But we got him a coach, and by the time we were shooting, he was king. So you hold it like this and pull the trigger. Pow, punk ass. Lorenz Tate, who plays O-Dog, the badass in the movie. It was amazing because we don't go for cliches, but at the time we thought, we're gonna get this big, black, buff guy, he got lacerations in his face and ashy knuckles, and he's gonna play O-Dog. And so we were interviewing a lot of people for O-Dog, and we couldn't find him. And finally we told our casting director to bring in the tape of the rejects. And the first reject was this kid came in right out of the Disney Casting 101. I had this sort of Disney look, you know, this really fresh, young kid look. But I'm originally from Chicago, so my interpretation of the guy was based on some guys that I had seen in Chicago. Man, oh, and I say, you know, the odds are against me, so I gotta flip this. I have to really go in there and knock it out. Oh, oh, you would sound like a little bitch, man. We yelled action, and he got down and started playing a dice game and ad-libbing. And it was like, oh, shit, like right away you recognize, like, this is crazy because this kid was so spot on in his mannerisms, body language, lingo, everything. What you say about my mama? He nailed it, you know, there's, there's no way anybody has even come close to this. Shit, nigga, I smoke anybody, nigga. I just don't give a fuck. Just hit us in the head, we go, this is even scarier. This charming looking kid oozing all this, this evil. Fuck. Ah! Damn. Suck on that, you bitch ass trick. We wanted to tell him he got the job, and the casting agent's like, no, no, just wait, let me go call him. And I ran out to the elevator. When he got on the elevator and said, this is yours, I didn't believe him, and I didn't think much of it until I got the call, and they said that you landed the part. And this was my first film. I had never done a movie. I had always been a television actor. So you like my little tape, don't you? Yeah, that shit was cool, nigga. Yeah, nigga. Jada Pinkett was on a different world. If I ever catch you with a gun in your hand, I will break your tail. You got that? She didn't come in to audition, because I think she was hesitant, as a lot of people were, who, who were trying to do something legitimate in this business, because it wasn't looked at as a legitimate project at the time. So she came in to meet with us, and somehow we convinced her to read a little bit. Watching Jada Pinkett read Ronnie was probably the strangest thing. All of a sudden, you're watching someone bring a character to life. Why are you tripping? You ain't doing jack shit here. King, why don't you just come with me? And on the spot, we knew that she was the the one for the role. Fuck Pernell, because you don't owe him shit, all right? You need to be glad that you graduated from high school and that you're alive at 18, and you need to do something with yourself before you end up like he did. Sam Jackson came to us because we wanted to do some stunt casting in certain areas. Hey. It was very intimidating because I, you know, I work with the actors. I was very intimidating. He would fuck with me every now and then. Just play with me. What the fuck you mean? You ain't got the money yet, motherfucker. Keisha, bring Mr. Butler a plate. A nice size plate, Keisha. 
Charles Dutton came the same way. We just begged for, for a cameo on this, that, and the other. The hunt is on. And you're the prey. The one that was uh, interesting was Bill Duke, who was retired from acting at the time, had called and said, will we hire someone on the crew? And we said, oh, yeah, we'll hire if you do this role for us. That was actually a classic moment. I mean, like, you know, Bill Duke, everybody talks about that. You know you done fucked up, man. You know you done fucked up. You done fucked up, you know that, don't you? So we had three veterans who came and rounded out the cast and provided legitimacy to the movie that, that it didn't have. You owe me some money, motherfucker! Hell no, but here you go. When we signed on to do Menace, New Line, there was a caveat that said, you got to hire a platinum rap artist in order for this movie to be greenlit. Slanging all that shit in the hood, and y'all ain't got no motherfucking money. We first saw MCA in a rap video, and he was in a project, and he had this dripping jerry curl, and we're like, who snuck him past, like, the, the censors? You know, like, how, you know, for lack of a better way of saying, you know, how they let this nigga get by, right? You know, like, this this guy's real right here. We got to get him. Hey, homie, you need some help? Uh, uh, uh. Having eight is short. Hole in the motherfucker. Yo, yo. Don't start that hood rat shit. You know ain't nobody no motherfucking hood rat. These are the cats we grew up listening to. They brought a flavor to it and a versimilitude that was really helpful in making people believe that you were dealing with South Central. Punk ass nigga. We made minutes when we were 20, and I remember thinking that was normal. It wasn't too recently I started realizing how abnormal that was. A real naive thing on our part was thinking that we can go down to the neighborhood and shoot and around real Grape Street Crips and then Jordan Downs, the housing project, and actually employ the real gangsters. We were able to shoot there because at the time there had been a peace treaty between the gangs, and we had hired a few of the guys on as technical consultants and emissaries to the neighborhood. Oh, shit, one time. To the scene where we're all just sitting on the wall drinking beer and the police comes around the corner chasing them out of the alley. Now the guys all around them dressed in purple are real guys. And they're like giving each other pounds, drinking 40 ounces and everything like that. Then there's a scene where O'Dog goes to Kane's grandparents' house uh, after he comes back from the hospital and everybody in that scene is from their neighborhood and a lot of them are gangsters. We always were watching our backs because, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen being in that neighborhood. Get your ass up out the car, nigga. We had a few scary moments where sometimes a uh, person on the crew might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Get the fuck out! Break yourself, nigga! But it, it was nothing major, man. They loved us down there and we loved them. Yo, what's up, boy? Yeah! They were just happy that anybody was there in a genuine way and involving them, too. And y'all gonna follow us, right? Yeah, nigga, we know where it's at, for. I'll never forget this one guy. I forget his name, but he was the scariest guy in the area. I mean, everything about him, his manner, his approach, his reputation. You would think if anybody was going to be somebody who was going to cause us problems or hurt somebody or anything, it was this guy. Why you come to this motherfucker so early all the time, man? You said 1 o'clock? I don't give a fuck what I said, nigga. And I remember that to try to defuse this, we offered him his job as like our head neighborhood security guy and he did a great job and at the end of it he came up to us and the guy was practically in tears because he was like nobody ever gave me a chance to do anything like this before they were very appreciative of us coming down there and not condescending them so we gleaned a lot of real stuff from them and listening to them or just having them around don't worry about shit i'm gonna handle this nigga for you people were coming up to us as actors thinking we were from Grape Street. Lorenz Tate got that a lot. They thought I was one of the cats in the neighborhood. They thought I was real, <laughs> one of the little BGs in the hood, so that was good for me. And, and we still mad at you for dropping all that blood on us. These cats were like, yo, what hood you from? And I was like, nah, um, I'm just doing a movie, man. And they were like, nah, for real. Like, what, what, what set you from? <laughs> Do this for hair, man. Man, you getting down, nigga. Your Hughes brothers had an unusual partnership. Alan works with the actors. Albert's uh, basically behind the camera. But they both could do either job, but it was just interesting to see how they, you know, come together and to pull off what they were able to pull off was amazing. What's going on, big boy? It's chilling, man. First week, there were some, some days where we clearly were out of our depth. Third day into the shoot, we thought our careers were over. And we also had the problem of some actor, the crew member is doubting the movie. I mean, there was an actor outright said, I don't know why I'm doing this shit. At the time, I remember feeling like 
We just gotta get through this shit. Ironically, sometimes the days that feel like really bad make for better scenes. The, the days you feel like you really got something, you, most of the time you really don't have anything. Here, put that in for me. Nigga, you better go somewhere with that black power shit. You know that shit gets no play in this ride. Sometimes we didn't have enough time to do things or set up a steady camera, set up a dolly, and we would go handheld. And a lot of people thought that was a stylistic choice, you know, like, oh, they're, they're very good at that gritty run and gun style. And it's like, no, nah, that was almost by accident or just by happenstance, we just had to do that. You alive, ain't you? And who said that's good? First test screening. It went through the roof and to this day was the highest score they ever got at New Line Cinema. It scored like bananas and it was really loud and people were very involved. It was like a prize fight. Everybody was jumping up and down with excitement and. Um, like they're watching a boxing match. And when the lights went up, there was like 20 gang members down in the front row weeping their eyes out. And the cards came back, and I think it was 97%, which is unheard of. Hey, this for the homies who ain't here. Going to Khan was great. We were part of the director's fortnight. We didn't know what to expect. It was like eight hours a day of interviews back to back to back to back to back. We didn't have time to even think. We weren't prepared for it, and basically had to get like B12 shots by the end of the second day because we were so fried. The Cannes experience was our first taste of pseudo-celebrity. There was a moment where we were walking down the street and Ebert walked up and started talking to us about our movie. And there would be these kids that would come up and go, LaFresh Hughes, LaFresh Hughes, and we would be signing these eight by nine pictures they had of us out there. When the film was over, it got our standing ovation and we were all called to the uh, stage. And we stood on stage, and there's just this wall of people going crazy and clapping and screaming and, and hollering. And standing on stage with that, in front of that wall of people, I said to myself, this is the closest I'll ever get to feeling like a rock star right now. <laughs> the film was pretty much positively reviewed. There were some harsh reviews, obviously. You know, again, socially irresponsible and just excessively violent. Oprah is Miss Positive, and we had heard through the grapevine that she had said, this is a terrible movie, don't go see it, it's negative and all this other stuff. And that was kind of a, a stamp of approval for us. We're like, if Oprah hates this movie, that, that's good for us, basically, because we're not going for the Oprah crowd. The Hughes brothers and I wanted to make a film that you either love it or you hate it. And if you love it, great. But if you hate it, I'm perfectly okay with that because that's a very powerful emotion. I'd rather make a movie that you love or hate than you don't really remember, you know, two weeks later or a month later or whatever. The quote is, if, if you hate black people, this movie will make you hate them more. But it basically meant if you're just a dumbass hick that already hates black people, this ain't gonna make you love black people. It was a big hit. You know, we did the film for about $3 million and it grossed almost $30 million. Bingo. They did a survey in all the inner cities, we were beating Jurassic Park that summer. Yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. It started out with a very high per screen average, but it was only on about seven or 800 screens. And that movie just played and played and played and played. The reaction was scary. <laughs> it was scary to me because people loved it. People were standing up in some theaters. You had people talking back to the screen, and I'm not suggesting all brothers and sisters talk back to the screen, but on Menace, you're damn right we got to talk back to the screen. Uh, I remember going to the movie theater and watching, you know, grown, grown men, grown thug, rough, getting, you know, crying at the film. Man, get some fucking help! <laughs> Not my nigga. And what happens is you have these gang members coming from each territory to congregate in these theaters, and obviously certain things happen. Well, what's up, homies? Hey, let's go twist this nigga's cap back, man. It really started back with colors. And then New Jack City, and then Boys in the Hood. A lot of people in gang culture thought Master Society was real, and that what they saw on screen, they recognized. Damn, and we just gonna find these little marks and smoke them. Shit ain't that hard. So they were all coming to the theater at the same time to see this movie. And anytime you do that, you're gonna get some conflicts. <laughs> Do we feel responsible for gang activity? No. Do we feel bad that if people were shot during, you know, or killed for that matter, during viewing Menace, that, hell yeah, that 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 doesn't feel good. Menace to society, 
you know, it's a cautionary tale. So we set out to make something that was as real as possible. And not everybody's gonna get the message. You know, some people wanna go out and replicate, but other people it's sort of reflective. So I think it really affected people emotionally. So people responded to it either positively or negatively based on their own personal experience. <laughs> The character of Cain is somebody that almost anybody can empathize, if not sympathize with. You see in the early scenes of him seeing his father murder a guy right in front of him as a little kid, what chance did he ever have not to have his life go along this path? But you can also see that he wants to break out of it. He just doesn't know how. And it's tragic that the decisions he makes to escape this life come too late for him. And it's a cautionary note. Fight, fight, come on. The reaction was what we wanted. We had a lot of people, other than black people, other than Latin people come up to us and say, wow, I never knew that that happened to these kids or that's where they came from and that's why the way they are. Hey, do you care whether you live or die? I don't know.